All right. So uh, welcome to Scorpio season, everybody. I'm your host, Venkat, and I'm here with my co-host, Lisa. Hey, Venkat. <laughs> and I notice you're wearing, uh, uh, what do you call it, a workshop core fashion thing now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I've got, um, I got some overalls on. It's true. Cool. Well, so today uh, we're having our first episode back of Scorpio season for season two, and we're very excited to have our first guest. Ellen K. Chevel Dayoff. Well, I'm not sure I pronounced that uh, last name right. Yeah, Chevel Dayoff. And I met Ellen almost 10 years ago when I was driving through Canada. And Ellen has a superpower she'll be talking to us about, but it's related to the theme of the episode, which is the letter A, and um, the theme is going to be A for air quality. So Ellen has a superpower related to air quality. Great. All right. Let's, let's get Ellen in the chat. Um, Hello. Can you hey. hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Perfect. So welcome to Scorpio season, Ellen. And uh, you and I met, what was it, nine years ago, right? When I drove through Waterloo? Yes. Yes. And uh, I discovered that you have a very interesting superpower. So tell us about your superpower. Well, I have a very good sense of smell. So I can smell a lot of things that other people won't notice. I also uh, have a medical condition called multiple chemical sensitivities, mm -hmm. but it's not clear whether that's related to my um, sense of smell or not. A lot of people with that condition report a heightened sense of smell, but uh, it might be just they notice it more because it affects them more. But um, other people think that a sense of a good sense of smell has to do with the actual um, configuration of like your nasal passages and stuff like that, like how the air gets to your olfactory receptors. But most things about human olfaction are an open research question. No one actually knows how it all works. So. All right, and you're at the sort of frontier of um, human smelling capability. So uh, let's just try and get an idea of uh, how you experience life in a way that uh, Lisa and I don't. So we, uh, the three of us seem to be in very similar rooms at the moment. So when I try to smell this room, I basically get nothing. I mean, it's, um, there's no unpleasant smells. There's no particularly pleasant smells. What do you smell in your room, Lisa? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Ellen, what's the smellscape where you are right now? I also don't smell all that much, but mostly because I've designed my entire environment to be that way. <laughs> So, uh, but I, I still do smell some things at the moment. Like, for example, my furnace had come on a little bit. So there's a little bit of burning dust in the mm -hmm. background. Um, there's also a little bit of smells coming in from outside from the restaurant across the street. There's some cooking smells coming in from that. This kind of drawn into my house by the different fans. Um, and uh, I have the door to my kitchen closed because I have to keep that separate from the rest of my environment so that the cooking smells don't bother me in the rest of my house. But if I went into my kitchen, I would smell, I have some fruit, so I would smell the fruit on my counter. Or if I started cooking something, I would definitely smell that. But um, yeah, I can s smell all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> have you always had such a great sense of smell or was there a point in time at which it really became kind of a larger feature than it had been previously? I think I've always had a good sense of smell, although I've had like when I had more environmental allergies, they became worse when I was in high school. So mm -hmm. I see. Cool. So when you smell, you mentioned that um, smells have like a beginning, a middle and an end. So can you sort of help us, I don't know, think about how you experience smell? Like, is it similar to vision for the rest of us? Or like, what is it like? Well, it does seem to be something I experience in sort of a spatial way, or like I'll have a map in my head that corresponds to different places I've been and what they've smelled like. But it's also an ever-changing map because it really depends how the air is moving. 
like upwind and downwind are concepts that I think about a lot in my daily life. Just I'm here. Oh, where is the wind coming from over there? Okay. That's why I'm smelling that thing. Or if I want to avoid smelling that thing and I need to sort of change my route. Oh, I'm getting off track here. You asked about <laughs> the, the uh, beginning, middle and end of a smell. So when I smell things, there is, it is definitely experience over time. Like it, it kind of matters how the air is moving in a room. Like perfumers will talk about top notes, mid notes and base notes. And I would also add to that sort of like an after smell, like just like an aftertaste, like you taste something, there's an aftertaste. I would say an after smell is the same sort of thing. So when I first smell something, there will be sort of the very beginning of a smell. And I think it also has something to do with how it, the molecules move around in the air. I, I'm not, I can't prove this, but like the uh, things that are top notes seem to sort of zip around the air faster and they bounce off the walls more. Um, sort of the mid notes are like, they move less fast than that. And then sort of the base notes, they tend to stick to materials more and they maybe would just like release a little bit of things over time and so like when I when I breathe in and I'm trying to like I identify a new smell or figure out what I'm smelling in the air there's like it's not just like a one data point or a point source or whatever it's like an experience over time. So since we just talked about wood smoke and there's been a lot of wood smoke here in California lots of forest fires and even though I'm not as sensitive, I, I can smell it, but to me, it's just a burning smell. That's as high resolution as I can describe it. So uh, what does a uh, wood smoke smell like to you in terms of like the smell profile, like top, bottom notes? Can, are there words you can put to those? Unfortunately, the English language does not have very many good words for smell. This is one of like my daily frustrations because I wish it did. <laughs> I mean, there's some other cultures around the world who do have some vocabulary, like the Manique hunter-gatherer tribe in Thailand. There's some researchers went and talked to them and they were able to sort of, different people were able to reliably describe smells with the same words as each other. And But in English, there aren't really words to describe the features of a smell very well. Most people sort of rely on saying, oh, it's like this thing, or it reminds me of that thing. So for example, if I was to tell you just using the scent, like our sense of sight, uh, oh, there's something that reminds me a little bit of grass and a little bit like a dinner plate. You can probably imagine a m bunch of different things that might fit those two criteria. But like, then if I told you I, I was, it had the same shape as a dinner plate and the same color as grass, you might get closer to thinking that I was imagining a green frisbee, but we don't have those words for smell. Uh, like I can say, oh, it's a little bit like grass or it's a little bit like a dinner plate. And, but without being able to tell you in what way it's like those things, mm -hmm. it's, it's very hard to share my experiences with other people. And it's also, those words would also let me tell you something you've never seen before. And I could say, oh, there's, it has the shape of a Mobius strip and it's red and it's shiny and it's about eight feet tall. And if you kind of look up when you're going past this point, you would see it. I just described something you've probably never seen before, but if you saw it, you'd be able to recognize it. But I don't have those words for smell. I can usually recognize wood smoke like from a, a, a pretty long way away. I'll just maybe get catch a whiff of it. I'll be like, oh, what was that? it'll be very small sort of amount in the air. But then as I get closer to something that has, a, like is it producing the wood smoke, that's a source of wood smoke. So maybe there's a house and it has like a fireplace and the fireplace is going, then I'll smell more and more components of the smell because there's not, a, not all of them will travel so far. Can so, you actually uh, identify different trees and different types of wood? Oh yes. Oh, you can? Like, okay. Uh, okay. It, well, I, I have reactions to them. So, for example, um, pine trees. I'm not okay with being near pine trees. That messes me up. So I can, like, if I get, get some of that on the wind, I'll, I'll be able to tell that's it. I mean, I can also smell flowering trees, like lilacs and whatever, but I, I guess most people are able to. 
Yeah, can you tell when the wood is burning, what kind of wood they're burning sometimes? I haven't been able to match up, okay, this wood smells like this thing. Mm -hmm. I haven't actually like done all those experiments to figure right. out, okay, this one is that one. But mm -hmm. I like they, they do smell different to me, so I probably could learn to distinguish those things. You just need the mapping. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes I can tell it's not wood smoke, it's something else. Like there was a local dollar store that was burning and one day I came home and it, I mean, it was a few kilometers away, but I was like, okay, there's something burning and it's not just wood. And it turned out to be the dollar store. Oh, it was like on fire? <laughs> it was on fire. I find out later from <laughs> the news, but... Uh, Ah, uh, fascinating. That's really cool. So I wanted to ask you just really quickly while we're on the topic of wood smoke, you mentioned that more development in your area meant that there was more wood smoke smell in your neighborhood or in your environment when you go outside. Is that because more houses mean more people are burning wood or is it related to something else? Like, do you think Actually, it's other smells in my neighborhood that are bothering me that... Um... It, it, the, it did, this particular development in my neighborhood didn't add more wood smoke, but trying to find somewhere else to live, it's really, really hard to get away from wood smoke. Like my neighborhood that I'm in now was built the end of the 1950s, early 1960s. Mm -hmm. And it was built in such a way that most of the houses did not have wood fireplaces. But if you go to other neighborhoods in the city that were built in about the same era, a lot of them do have wood fireplaces. Cause I think it was more of like a richer area. So there's more status symbol, I guess, to, with the wood fireplaces. Yep. Um, so when I'm being, tr I mean, wood smoke is not the only thing that bothers me. There's an, uh, other things like the laundry smell from the vents from when people mm -hmm. use um, fabric softener in their dryers. Mm -hmm. uh, or um, I also have problems with car exhaust. So I can't really live right next to a busy road or right next to uh, a place with a lot of that laundry smell. And some of the newer parts of the city where they don't have wood fireplaces anymore have like really strong uh, laundry smell because like there's a whole bunch of townhouses close together or the really tall apartment buildings where they have like more, they're putting out more into the environment of that type of smell. Um, so also, it sounds like you're able to like wander around a city and almost make up like a olfactory map of a city. Like, can you, if, if you were blindfolded, would you be able to tell what part of your city you're in just by the smells? I'm not sure I'd be able to point, pinpoint which specific part, but I would be able to tell you what's in the air. Like, I would be able to say, okay, there's wood smoke, there is uh, laundry smell, there is car exhaust, there is pine trees, there are, like, I wouldn't necessarily be able to say I'm on this road in this part of the city, but I'd be able to say what's around me. Mm -hmm. And I guess that makes sense with like uh, wind patterns and stuff. So yeah, it's, it's not exactly like smell as a GPS thing. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting how smells have like, um, like areas that they cover based on the wind, it sounds like. So like there's like the source of it, but then kind of where you would experience it really depends on this like overlay map of like air movement, right? Yes. One thing I noticed is that I can outwalk diffusion in the air. Like if someone's like there's a source of smell that starts up and I I can um, walk far enough away to like not smell it for just a little, little bit of time and then it'll catch up to me. So, like, if, if it's not, like, really windy or whatever, it's just, like, still and things are diffusing through the air. Um, I s sometimes wear a mask with a carbon filter in it when I'm going out uh, public places, like, um, just to protect myself from different, like, perfumes and car exhaust and the different smells that bother me. So, so sometimes... Yeah, let's talk about masks uh, for a bit. So, you've been doing masks and um, sort of the kind of, like, Hygiene, all of us just learned six months ago. You've been doing that all your life, right? So Not how are you? Yeah. Since high school. So okay. about 20 years. So that's <laughs> like 20 years longer than most of us. So uh, has uh, COVID been less of a disruption in your life since you were already doing many of the things that are, many of the behaviors that are new to us or has it affected your life differently? I mean, it 
things are still worse than they would be without a global pandemic going on for me. But I think it was not very much of an adjust. I didn't have to adjust the way I thought about things very much in order to sort of incorporate it, the new information into my life. Like going out into a public space was already not a safe thing for me to do all the time. And there, I always had to be thinking, okay, how is the air moving in the space? What is going to be there? What will I do if what this thing or that thing happens? And just um, often when I get home from being out in public, I do always, you know, wash my hands. I usually I'll even take a shower just because things will stick to my hair that I'm allergic to. So if I don't want to just be like allergic reacting to my hair the whole rest of the evening or whatever, I'll just have to wash it off me. So like, it, in some ways, in a way, it, it's even less hard than some of the things I have to deal with because other people are also adapting. It's not just me and everyone else is just doing nothing. <laughs> it's like other people are at least somewhat aware and, and changing their behavior. And also there's a whole bunch of science coming out on it. Like, I'm lucky if I get one scientific paper per year about multiple chemical sensitivities but there's so many more scientific papers than that about COVID-19 and there are people around the world who are wanting to figure this out and they're using like their time and energy and brain power and scientific tools and everything to learn about it and and make progress and that's actually gives me a lot of hope and optimism because there's kind of a lot of areas in my life that are not like that. It's like, oh, well, it's a scientific mystery, whatever. There's not very many people in the world who are actually bothering to look into it or try to figure it out. Let's see. Uh, I, have oh. a, I have a mask. Um, just like one thing I've noticed, like with people who are wearing like COVID masks, they have the type that loop over their ears. Mm -hmm. But I, the one that I ended up wearing, like basically on a daily basis when I was going to university, it had uh, Velcro straps that wrap around my head. And I found that was easier to handle for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, like, if you're thinking about like, how can I wear a mask for longer? I would suggest maybe adding some Velcro straps. I also, the elastic um, band material, I would wash my masks with soap and water and then boil them for 10 minutes. And then a lot of the smells would kind of come off while it was boiling. Um, so, cause they would absorb things as they were going around. But if you have elastics, that's kind of rough on the elastics and they degrade. So that's another reason not to use elastics in your mask. Uh, we discovered like a little plastic thing that uh, takes the pressure off the bands. And that's, uh, um, that's another way to like wear masks for a long time. But my solution is to basically not go out much. So I don't have to wear a mask for long. <laughs> um, yeah, but let's uh, talk about air quality sensors. So um, this is like new kind of sensor technology for most of us. I just use an app from the local, I don't know, uh, fire service. I guess it's like almost like a weather report at this point in California. We have this, I have a bunch of apps on my phone and they talk about like PM 2.5, volatile organic compounds, uh, ozone and um, uh, nitrogen oxides. I think those are the four things it seems to track, uh, but, but how do you think about air quality? Uh, well, I'm actually impressed they have volatile organic compounds in the ones you're tracking because a lot of cities don't track that. I would say the most commonly tracked are particulates, so PM 2.5 or PM 10, uh, and uh, nitrogen oxide, and um, maybe they'll have sulfur dioxide or carbon monoxide, pollen, but like usually it's just kind of the nitrogen oxides and um, the particulates that they keep track of. And when I look at maps and like most uh, cities have at least like one weather station where they'll, they'll track like those maybe two or three things re related to air quality. Mm -hmm. But when I walk around a city, I smell so many different things in different areas. Like they don't, but there aren't sensors for each part of the city. There's just like one sensor per city. And that's not even necessarily everything that's in the air that you might care about. That's just the ones that they bother to put up sensors for. Yeah. So 
when I walk around, I can smell a lot more things than you would be able to pick up with just those like three or four sensors. For example, really with- expensive, right? The one you uh, shared with me, uh, one was like 400 bucks and the other was like 5,000 bucks. Like, uh, what's the difference? Like, what, what do these sensors do across the price range? Well, I actually bought the one that was like about $400 US and because it was a part- particulate sensor with uh, PM 2.5 and PM 10. And that just shows all the sort of particles of that size or smaller in the air. It'll kind of count uh, how, but you don't know what they were made of, just that they're there in that size. And I thought this might be a way for me to figure out um, wood smoke smell in the air, whether because one of the things when we were, I was looking for another place to live is I, wa- I would like to have somewhere where I don't breathe in wood smoke all the time. <laughs> That's like one of my criteria. And, but so far, my process for trying to find that out is I go there and I smell it with my nose and I have to be there in person. Mm-hmm. And it would be nice if I could either send someone else out with that like my husband if he could just go to a place and like take a look at the air quality sensor and let me know oh it's below this level maybe you should come check it out or oh no it's above this it's not worth taking a look at or I could maybe even mail it to someone in another city and say like hey can you walk around your neighborhood with the sensor let me know what it is and I could have some idea if it might be worth moving somewhere further away my actual experience with trying to use this sensor was that it didn't wasn't nearly as good as what I could sense with my nose. And it might have just not been measuring the right thing. When we went out to look at some vacant land, because the idea was we might be able to buy some land outside the city and then build a house on it. And just if we, we could find somewhere that was okay for me. And it was actually pretty good just in the summer, but I was like, what is it going to be like in the winter? Because at least in Canada, people get a little bit more, um, they desire more fires in the winter. It gets cold. They're like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a nice fire? Uh, And uh, a lot of the time, it's not because they need to. It's just something people like. People like to burn things like a lot. They just do it's one of the things i've found by like trying to find a place where people are not burning things there aren't very many um um, what's the state Uh, toronto is in ontario right no no yes ontario Ontario. okay Um, and seattle there's a huge amount of that like in winter even though people don't need it people constantly burn wood wood burning stoves and that sort of extends the fire season so you have like already sort of British Columbia and Washington state have like a fire season between, I would say, July and October. And then into winter, people start burning the wood stoves. So it's like five to six months a year, you have poor air quality just because of like um, wood smoke. Um, But yeah, I had one more question and then maybe Lisa has some uh, final questions. But my last question was, uh, so you've got air quality sensors on the sensing side of air quality. Uh, what about the filtration stuff? So we've been experimenting a lot with like HEPA filters and we carbon filters. So we're actually like trying to swap out filters and experiment right now with our HVAC system. Do you do a lot on that front, like filtration? I have experimented with it to some extent, but I ended up being allergic to some of the air filters. So it didn't work. <laughs> like there's some <laughs> carbon filters that I just... I was like, nope, this is actually making things worse for me. So what I actually have uh, on my furnace right now is an electrostatic filter, which takes out a lot of the things in the air. It's a similar type that that they use in hospitals, and it it sort of cleans the air at least to some extent over time um, as the air circulates in my house. But for me, it's not um, a complete solution. Like, I think... I need the air outside to be good so I can open my windows and air out my house and so that things are okay for me. Like, I don't think I can just completely rely on the filter to catch all of it. That's cool. Yeah, I think so my question was gonna be about, I recently discovered ozone machines. Is ozone something you've like looked into in terms of cleaning your air or is that kind of built into like electrostatic stuff? I don't know. 
I have used something that generates ozone in the house for a bit, like in previous, but as you said, you're not supposed to be there while that is happening. Um, and it, basically ozone will go around and like oxidize a bunch of stuff. Um, so it kind of depends what you have in your house to begin with, whether that's helpful or not. Um, the, I have been experimenting a little bit with using an ozone machine on my laundry just to see if I can get it to rinse out some of the, the soap because I was having a, an issue with my water. Um, and that it did help with that a little bit, but uh, it's, especially when I'm staying inside all the time, having something generating ozone is a bit of a, a problem. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, I think small amounts of ozone actually smell good but uh, it sort of does a number on your lungs if you're breathing too much for too long. You get that burning sensation, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh -huh. I definitely had some throat issues after doing it. I was doing it outside. I was doing my car. I have like a used car that had some mold in it. So I cleaned the mold out and then ozone the car. Um, and just even like having it outside and like the, the hose I was using to pump it into the car was a little leaky. And then you know, I could smell it. And then like a few hours later, I definitely had like a sore throat that was from it, so. I think air pollution affects everyone, at least a little bit, or most people at least. Like it affects me more than most people, but like if you even look at some of the scientific studies, like the, there is an effect. Like um, there was a study in Quebec where they followed like a thousand genetically similar people whose ancestors all came from the same small town in Quebec. And they uh, looked at where um, they, were, they had by that point moved to many <laughs> different other uh, different places, but um, they could, they, they did a study of them and their neighbors and they all had the same uh, epigenetic profile. Like all their, the genes that were switched on and off were about the same as their neighbors and they could kind of tell just from looking at that what postal code people were from and they and it they people had more similarities to their genetically dissimilar neighbors than they had to like the genetically similar people who lived in other places and even like their risk fast factors for diseases were uh, more correlated to all of the air pollution exposures that they'd had rather than their DNA mm -hmm. so I, there's like it does seem to be something that affects people even down to the level of their epigenetics just from living in different places and being exposed to different things and also you can sort of do statistics and estimate how many people have had health problems or would die after being exposed to a certain amount of pollution like when they closed down the coal plants in Ontario uh, they did some statistics and estimated that that saves 600 lives a year. And that's not even counting all the people who just had like non-fatal health problems. I've seen very similar statistics for um, the effects of uh, early COVID when the traffic went way down and they were estimating that the number of people who, whose lives were saved simply because of air pollution being lower, that was like uh, in some cases, um, like in Beijing and other really polluted cities that almost like made up for the people dying of COVID. So yeah, I can imagine it's a pretty significant effect. But uh, well, thanks a lot, Ellen, for uh, joining us and helping us um, sort of see, I don't know, with higher resolution into issues of smell and air quality. Yeah, well, thank great. you for having me. Yep. Cool, yeah, thank you. All right, all right. So that was an interesting chat. And I, don't know, I got to thinking about like, can we ever do smell on virtual reality? That's where my head was. Oh, really? my, th my brain went more to at what point does air quality become a political issue? Um, or like, when do politics of air start to become more important than they are currently? Um, just hearing Ellen talk about like location and where to live and, you know, redevelopment and the impacts of like density on air quality. Um, yeah. Oh. I think uh, she's sort of like an, it, it's almost like a canary in a coal mine kind of situation. Sensitive people like her are already experiencing 
what the rest of us will experience in 10 years, right? Like pollution is getting worse, especially like everywhere wildfires are getting worse. Um, like, and it's hard to design policy for this stuff. I was reading about like cities which do the um, traffic management through like odd even days. Have you seen, heard of this? Like on uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, people with even numbered license plates can drive and so forth. And somewhere, I forget which city it was, I think it was Sao Paulo or somewhere in Brazil. Many Maybe. cities do this, but I'm thinking of okay. one specific city where the incentive backfired badly because everybody ended up buying like a second clunker car with like the other license plate style. And it ended up making air pollution worse because now half the cars on the road were like clunkers doing pollution, right? But yeah, it's yeah. going to become bigger and bigger. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. And yeah, I think that was kind of, a, it's kind of weird to talk to someone where you feel like you're getting a preview of the future a little yeah. bit. Um, we should look for more people who are like experiencing the future. We are not. <laughs> yeah. Be like the William Gibson, the future yeah. is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Um, yeah. Absolutely. All right. So that was A and we got air quality. So Next will be B, and we'll be talking, oh, Bitcoin, yeah. So you'll have some updates for us from the stuff you've been doing. Yeah, it's a great future-looking thing, I guess, you know. <laughs> You're part of the unevenly distributed future for Bitcoin, so, all right. Great. All right, Venkat, always a pleasure. I'll see you next week. See you next week. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one-hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokinscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.